Next on Startup, we head to Asheville, North Carolina to talk to Grace and Mariano, two friends that met in college and started Appalach, a clothing company that makes handmade outdoor apparel with locally sourced wool. Then we head to Edwardsville, Illinois to meet with Jenny and Ed, a married couple that met in culinary school and started Cleveland Heath, a restaurant that has critics raving from all over the country. All of this and more is next on Startup. It all starts with an idea and everyone has them. In the world of business where you choose to take your idea determines where your idea will take you. Baker College is proud to support Startup and those who dare to share their ideas with the world. The American small business was built on one thing, relationships. And every time a customer walks through the door, a new one begins. Pay Anywhere was built to help entrepreneurs do what they do best. So keep loving what you do. Just get paid for it. Pay Anywhere. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail. So I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm on Jupiter Road in Asheville, North Carolina, and we're gonna go talk to Grace and Mariano who started Appalach a sustainable and socially conscious clothing company. Now, sustainability has always been important to Grace and Mariano, so when they met in Asheville, they decided to open a company that could live up to their high standards. Let's go hear their story. More than 97% of apparel sold in the U.S. is made overseas, yet American and Chinese consumers are willing to pay up to a 60% premium for goods labeled made in the USA. Grace and Mariano are passionate about sustainability and maintaining a high level of consciousness toward the environment. Their vision was to start a company that would create truly sustainable products while creating for them a full-time living. Tell me who you are and your background, a little personal history about yourselves. Uh, well, my name is Grace Gouin. I'm living in North Carolina now in Asheville, but I'm originally from Cumberland, Rhode Island, which is a small town in a small state. Started sewing when I was really young with my mom and my grandmother. When I moved to Asheville, I worked for the first two years that I was here at an organic cotton clothing company. And then that's where I met Mariano. So my name is Mariano de Guzman. I was born and raised in Kenosha, Wisconsin. In undergrad, I studied history and history science and saw how unsustainable a lot of the, the industry is when it comes to manufacturing. And I figured I had to learn more about this. Explain, just clarify, what is unsustainable about, about clothing? The whole industry is set up to make money. It's not about people who, of course. it's not about the people who make the clothing or about the environment. Oftentimes they're the one who pays the most cost of cheap clothing. Um, throwaway clothing, clothing that's only made to last a few, few seasons, right. fads, that whole thing is, we think is a really unsustainable model. You wanted to change what was going on yeah. and do something We really better. wanted to revolutionize the way clothing was made, sold, and used. And so we wanted to start a company that from the start, from our very DNA, we have um, ethics and responsibility built into that. Yeah. So a lot of the companies, they present the image of doing exactly. it sustainably, but they're yeah. not really doing yeah, I it. I think that in most industries where you start to see sustainable or green or like a leaf slapped onto something, you need to be aware of greenwashing and really like start to look below the surface. Well, it's become a marketing tool. Exactly. It is. Green exactly. is, is a huge marketing yeah. thing. Yeah. So what, what can we even trust is sustainable or really exactly. organic or green these days? For us, that was the most frustrating part of the whole apparel industry. Yeah. We actually don't even talk that much about the sustainability aspect of what we do from like as our primary selling point because 
I think that gets tiring for people after a while. We've heard it a lot. Yeah. yeah. The U.S. apparel and footwear industry directly employs more than 4 million U.S. workers, which is 3% of the entire U.S. workforce. You guys met at this place. Yeah. You started talking. You have the visions for the company. You have the ability to sew. And what was that first conversation? We started a Pinterest board that we could both pin to, that we both felt like summed up our individual design aesthetics and things that we wanted to see and things that we liked visually because it has to look good. You said it took a year to like make a shirt. Exactly. A year to get it onto the website. It took it took a year for us to create it. It really did. Well, why don't we why don't we step back and and just take this step by step. What came first? Wool came first. Wool came first. Wool came first because we wanted to okay, make sure we were working with the most sustainable material that we could mm -hmm. and of so again, course. just like starting yeah. at the very bottom of like our ethics and responsibilities, just like what fiber out there can allow us to be the most sustainable we can. And from there, we took the Pinterest board and tried to like create wool clothing from that. Mm -hmm. And then we worked with a graphic designer on the logo and the website. What did it cost in the beginning to, well, Pinterest, obviously, that's free. free Your yeah. time is free. That's an opportunity yeah. cost. Um, but the website, the logo, that's when you start getting into costs. Costs, right. Exactly. What, did it, what, what was the experience? Uh, my wife and I put in some money um, to starting out and we um, helped create the website. Then I went to my parents and showed them kind of like a business plan and they was like, well, this is pretty good. Let's just go ahead and, and fund you guys $100,000. So my parents gave me $100,000 and said, do it. <laughs> Your first article of clothing, where did that come from and how did you find the farm to source the wool? Rambouillet is a type of sheep. It's a cousin to the Merino, mm -hmm. um, which is a sheep that I think most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, though mostly merino sheep are in Australia. And for us, that carbon footprint of transporting something all the way across the ocean yeah. is already kind of working against the sustainable aspect of wool as fiber. And you found there was one here in North Carolina? Yeah. There's a small farm. So <laughs> one of my friends in the area who has a farm, he was looking for sheep. And he wanted sheep that he could um, shear and sell the wool for. And he was asking me, what, do you, what would you use? And I said, Rambouillet. What is your uh, relationship or affiliation with, uh, with uh, Grace and Mariano? Well, that was a very fortuitous thing. Uh, just about the time I was going to switch uh, breeds, I studied up and decided that Rambouillet was really ideal, although there are not many raised here in the southeast. And along comes Mariano and Grace, who are starting an apparel company that wants to use only Rambouillet wool. So it, it was just perfect. And Serendipitous. Yeah, huh? yeah. So uh, we're very happy about that. According to Bloomberg Business Week, make sure that you're telling consumers your story, provide them with a link to a video, and make it easy for them to share. And your cause may be the reason that they'll spend the extra money on your brand. Now you have the wool, you have the designs. Tell me about the first shirt. Well, okay, so the, it's from a raw fiber, the wool goes from Montana to South Carolina, mm -hmm. where it's cleaned at this place called Chargers. And then it's brought from Chargers to where we get it spun into yarn, and mm -hmm. that's in, also in South Carolina. Um, and then it's brought over into North Carolina, where it's knit into fabric. And then after it's in fabric, it can be cut and sewn. And then that's done at Opportunity Threads. And then after that, it's dyed in Raleigh, North Carolina into the different colors that you see on the website. And what's your primary yeah. platform for sales, so e-commerce? Primarily say. is just online on appalash.com. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of like a risky move for us because when we were thinking about the business plan and we were thinking about should we do wholesale, mm -hmm. which most people do, or do just this direct consumer ourselves. So well, we have to figure out how to cut the cost somewhere. There just wasn't anywhere to cut the cost unless you used a, another material or you didn't do the Which sewing you didn't in want the to States. Do. Right. Yeah. So instead of compromising on the quality of the product, we said, you know, well, if we just go ahead and sell it right to the person that's going to wear it. How are you marketing? What are your sales right now? How are things going? So right now, our marketing is um, primarily search engine optimization. We try to figure out ways to maximize our really small advertising budget, and that's through social media. We're on Pinterest a lot, Instagram, those types of things which can reach a lot of people. And we also did the Kickstarter campaign last fall to help us um, raise funds to purchase the Stoll Full Fashioned Knitting okay. Machine, which is what's going to go in here. And what, what was your goal and what did you raise? 
Our goal was 50,000 and we raised 55,000. 55,000? Yeah. 55, yeah. yeah. Well, you had a successful campaign. Yeah. It was. Did that help a lot? Yeah. It did. So we're Same. really excited about that. And we're excited about transforming the way clothing is made. And that's why we did the Kickstarter campaign to have this machine and we can finally make custom fit sweaters on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. So that means for you, um, you give us your measurements mm -hmm. and we'll put it into the machine and we'll and knit down a sweater. sweater in less than an hour wow. exactly to your measurements. We're the first company in the world to do this and we're excited about doing it First here. company in the world to do it here. And we're excited to do it here in North Carolina. So, so the, they build the machines. The machines are being used all over the world right now, but they're yeah. not doing it in, in, a, in a way that we're doing it. Ah, so we okay. took um, the, the machine, created proprietary software, and were able to take this idea to scale. I get it now. Okay, yeah. so the machine existed. It's just the way that you were using the machine is what's proprietary. Exactly. Did you get a patent on that yet? We're in the process of getting a patent for it right now. Good, because that's obviously very important. Yeah. Now let's talk about AppLatch. Uh, what do you think about the products? They're lovely. I love them. Um, I'm amazed that they're able to do all U.S. I love that they're ethically driven. They're lovely people. If somebody else was looking to go to clothing retail, what advice would you give them looking back at your journey? I mean, when I look back at my journey, I think about all the hardships like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I think about me maxing out credit cards, um, my parents giving them, me, their money for retirement. Um, uh, us having to live with my, my father-in-law because we can't pay the bills. And thinking that this can all come together and this is worth it. I think you, an entrepreneur has to go all in. There are a million ways to start a business, but how did Grace and Mariano do it? Let's find out. They started with around $25,000 in the bank and an average credit score of 700. It took $125,000 to open the business, acquired from a family loan. And in their first year, they profited $76,000. The one word that Grace and Mariano would use to describe what it takes to start a business is drive. When starting a business, it takes sheer willpower and determination. And you can't be sheepish about the level of quality in the products that you make. You also have to shave off your expenses and make sure you weave together a good business plan. It worked for Grace and Mariano, and it can work for you. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Apple Apps. I'm on North Main Street in Edwardsville, Illinois, and I'm going to go talk with Jenny and Ed, who created Cleveland Heath an American restaurant that has critics raving all over the country. Let's go hear their story. Farm to Table refers to a movement concerned with producing food locally and offering this food to local consumers. Linked to the local food movement, Farm to Table is promoted by some in the agriculture, food service, and restaurant communities. Jennifer and Ed met in Salt Lake City while attending Culinary Institute of America. And after working at some of the country's top restaurants, they decided to bring their talent for credible comfort cuisine back to Jennifer's hometown. Tell me about your, yourself, your history, your past, like education, a little bit about work. I went to high school. I grew up here locally. Um, after high school, went to college in Springfield, Missouri, studied biology, and then from there, uh, Salt Lake City, which is where we met. I graduated from the University of Utah in natural resource management and was simultaneously working in restaurants. When did the moment come when you decided that this was going to be it and not a stepping stone to a real job, so to speak? Yeah, we, we were sitting in the, um, her apartment and it was kind of, for me, all the moments of my life had come to a head. We, I was done with college, working for the federal government. I quit my favorite job at the brew pub. I said, well, if it weren't for me, what else would you do? And he was like, well, I'd go to culinary school. And I was like, then let's go to culinary school. Obviously, the passion was food and restaurants. And uh, we, we decided to take it to Napa and uh, go to Culinary Institute of America. Being a couple in a business is a feat in and of itself sometimes. <laughs> it's really hard. So talk about you guys meeting and some of the challenges you had to overcome with this whole venture. Yeah, you know, we when we started it was, we had a really great working relationship when we yeah. started. Um, I think... <laughs> when we started. <laughs> when we started. There are some great stories. Yes, there are. I mean, we, we definitely got along so well and we we knew we had to be tested a lot. And it's been, it's been hard, but you know, 
what what isn't hard that, that you it's have to work it. for. Yeah. And I, I think for us too, we still see the restaurant as the common goal. So if if we're stuck on something that's really like bothering both of us, it really boils down to what's best for the business. How important is time apart compared to time together? Yeah, you know, we're we're course. together probably 20 out of 24 hours a day. That's a lot. Um, a lot, a lot, lot. of days. It's yeah. a lot. I think we're both kind of introverted and so time apart is sure. really, really important to kind of reset yourself, but it's also really hard to find. And uh, you know, quality time is so important except for like when we're around each other, yeah. this consumes us. You know, people like to see the owners out front. They really, sure. I mean, they love it. And so we really want to, to be here also because we're, we see things a little bit differently. Well, you form a bond with your clients yeah. too, and then they feel like you're friends. Yeah. You're not just the people that own the restaurant. People right. love, love seeing Jenny out front. They love it. Well, but, and you're like, you're glad to see see them too. I mean, we don't we don't have a <laughs> yeah. life outside of here and so like the the people that we love seeing here are kind of our friends. The restaurant industry is the largest employer in the US outside of the government, employing around 12.5 million people. Take us back to that moment when you're at the Culinary Institute of America and you guys decided that you're going to come back near your hometown mm -hmm. in uh, Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, tell me the whole story from beginning to where we sit today. My sister texted me that there was an open restaurant space in wow. downtown Edwardsville, and I was, was joking, but I was like, "Could you have Ryan go check that out for us, please?" And yeah. so he, you know, he was nice enough to come over here and uh, met with the landlord. And they decided, well, we want to open up a restaurant somewhere. They were coming mm -hmm. out of culinary school. Yeah. Uh, they weren't sure if it was Utah, for example, where it's from, right? Uh, St. Louis area or something like that. I said, "Well, if you open up in the Edwardsville area, we can help you out." We know a lot of people, we've been here for a while, our kids yeah. go to school in the area. Huge bonus. Huge bonus. Uh, they found the space that you see right now. You walked in, it was beautiful, it was very comfortable, it was, you could envision what the kitchen was gonna look like. Was it like an American style pub sort of thing? Or no, Irish bar? it was or? a really nice fine dining place. Did you sit down with the landlord and start lease negotiations or what was step one? I really just talking to him and getting a feel from he and his wife own this building and they have for a long time and they just seem to be a really good fit for us. Um, but I mean, I don't think you can have a better location um, on Main Street than this. So. so you went back after being here for that went week? Back, and um, talked to the landlord again one more time and then mm -hmm. really just kind of decided to go for it and just worked odd jobs around here, waitressing kind of to have an income while we were yeah. here, sleeping in my parents' basement. Um, we had pets, so they moved into my parents' house with us. I mean, it's kind of a mess. Yeah. Uh, we signed the lease October 17th. We were open November 17th of that year. One month. Yeah. One month. With the build out yeah. and everything. We'd get off work at 10 o'clock at night. My brother-in-law would meet us over here with buckets of paints and ladders. I mean, we just kind of, and we'd be here till 2 o'clock in the morning. they got a nice blend. You've got yeah. Daniels in front of the house. She's got yeah. a great skill with the wine sets. Yeah. Uh, so that was a no-brainer for her. And yeah. then uh, Ed had the food part of it. So helping them start up, it wasn't necessarily the restaurant part of it, it was the back office, uh, how to deal with the city, for example. Yeah. How to deal with the architect, the plumbing, and that type of thing. It's almost my duty as a fellow entrepreneur to make sure they succeed as best as I can possibly make that happen. Right. And any entrepreneur, all they have to do is talk to the other local entrepreneurs in their neighborhood, and let me tell you, the support just comes out of the woodwork, and they go, hey, they're serious about it, they put a few dollars into it, yep. let's help them succeed, which is why they have what they have to Can't be too proud to ask. No. Absolutely, you gotta ask. Did you do some math and kind of reverse engineer what you would have to make on a daily basis, weekend basis? And Yeah, and we had kind of a working, I, and she makes fun of me a little bit, we did have a working business plan. Just it wasn't a full, wasn't complete business plan. It wasn't as good as it probably needed to be. Right. But, I mean, we thought we'd have 12 employees and we have 40. So we were kind of, we 40. really planned, we planned tight and we planned small. How'd you scrape up the money to pay the lease? And then of course you have inventory, renovations, what was your total cost were versus how much actual money did you have to your name? Uh, we had about zero dollars <laughs> Okay, <our> name. <laughs> yeah, you have a little more than me. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, we moved back. I had secured what I thought was gonna do it and it was really just a loan through a credit card company, which is not a great idea, I know. <laughs> but um, when we got back here, we had already moved and it fell through. Um, and it was like $25,000, you know, not, not a lot, but still a lot to sign your name to when yeah. you have nothing. Right. Um, and so my family kind of found out and my grandmother would, offered to loan us that to get going. 
uh, which was, I mean, a lifesaver. The really good thing about being able to open up a business for now, without a lot of money is that you end up without a lot of debt. <laughs> so you guys, yeah. uh, going into your third year, or in your third year, um, are you break, broke even? You're we've, turning a profit? You're making money? Or? We've paid everyone back. Um, wow. Paid off the credit card debt, thank God. Um, paid my grandma back, and we're able to pay ourselves, which is great. Wow. I mean, that didn't happen it. for the first couple of years. <laughs> for, for a that's a success sure. story in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. The, the paycheck I don't take for granted, that's for no. sure. According to entrepreneur.com, successful restaurateurs agree that the best preparation for owning a restaurant is to work in someone else's first. Think of it as getting paid to be educated. Is pretty much everything that you're doing in season for the most part? Yes, for, for the most part. There are, when we change menus, we might have a little carryover, right. um, but for the most part, everything we do tries to center around that, that seasonality. Obviously, winter is the hardest yeah. time for us. For so sure. you're not doing like a caprese salad till August, right. like, roughly. Yeah, we do a great tomato salad in the summertime. We get requests for it in the winter, and we just say, you know, you're not going to get great tomatoes this time of year. So, Going into this, how did, how did you decide what the theme was going to be, deciding, is this kind of a classic American? Yeah, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, we, we were shooting for kind of a new modern American. Okay. Um, we picked from tons of regions, countries, and we put our own spin on it. So mm -hmm. nothing that we do is really ever um, an exact, you know, spot on dish from France or anything. Everything's sure. got our own Cleveland Heath twist on it. What brought you to Cleveland Heath tonight? My parents are, uh, they, they come here probably three times a month. And, oh, wow. Uh, we've been coming here for two years, and it's just one of the most fabulous dining experiences in the St. Louis area. What is it that separates it from other restaurants? The service is always exceptional. The food is always delicious. The cocktails are good. Not that I should be saying that right now, but <laughs> I was like, I like those too. It's just always delicious. We always leave really uncomfortably full. and very happy so how does it feel to have have done it to succeed do you ever stop and say wow we did it like something like that yeah I think so yeah. I mean we do but the hardest part is that it's you can't you got to keep going there can never be the complacency of saying we made it and we can relax now you know every day we walk in here we both walk in with a heart rate of 120 and <laughs> we're, we're looking at the guests like? yeah we look at the you know every single review we try to make sure that we're on point with you know, did something happen last night that we didn't hear about? So everything, every day is a, it's a learning experience and it's, we try to improve on what we did the day before. What's the end goal, I suppose? I mean, happiness is sort of a subjective term. What is, what is happiness as you would define it? I think happiness for us is getting back to a place where you have that kind of daily freedom to balance, and balance get out of here, you know, do, do what makes you happy. Um, and I think we're getting there. Well, thank you guys so much for meeting with us, thank and I wish you nothing us. but the best success in the world for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are a million ways to start a business, but how did Jennifer and Ed do it? Let's find out. They started with about $200 in the bank and a credit score of around 725. They borrowed $40,000 from family members to open the business and made $166,000 in their first year, taking only a slight loss. The one word that they use to describe what it takes to really make it in business is tenacity. Entrepreneurs are always cooking up good ideas, but Jenny and Ed's concept seem to have all the right ingredients. They let this idea marinate for a while, but then they took it off the back burner and have served up a tasty business. This isn't gonna be easy, and sometimes it's gonna feel like it's more than you can stomach. But remember, you should never desert your dreams. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Cleveland Heath. I think the most important skill for all entrepreneurs is you have to be relentless, you have to be unwilling um, to, to be unsuccessful and to lose. Uh, you have to be passionate about something with your heart and soul, um, but then you have to be resilient because it's, it's really hard work and you know, if, if it was easy, I think everyone would do it. Um, and one person once said to me, if you know what it takes to become an entrepreneur uh, and to start a company, you may never do it. And that sentence really runs through my head a lot because it's so true, it's such hard work. Next time on Startup, we head over to Nashville, Tennessee to talk with Chip 
a musician turned roadie who created Celebrity Bus Drivers Academy, a one-of-a-kind school that teaches people how to drive a bus for celebrities. Then we head over to St. Louis, Missouri to talk to Dawn, a true humanitarian who created Made for Freedom, a clothing company that employs former victims of human trafficking. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. another option for you. Okay. Let's see, this might be a little bit more your color. This one fits perfect. Oh, it feels good too. Like it was made for you? I feel very free. What? So I know we're on opposite sides of the fence, but why do you always gotta balk about what you do, huh? American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. The American small business was built on one thing, relationships. And every time a customer walks through the door, a new one begins. Pay Anywhere was built to help entrepreneurs do what they do best. So keep loving what you do. Just get paid for it. Pay Anywhere. It all starts with an idea, and everyone has them. In the world of business, where you choose to take your idea determines where your idea will take you. Baker College is proud to support startups and those who dare to share their ideas with the world.